My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. What's the test of a good Christian? Strict adherence to doctrine? Or slavishly following the church's moral and ethical code? Or is a good Christian the one who volunteers for every church committee and potluck supper? Or the person who champions every social justice campaign? What makes a good Christian? Whether we like to admit it or not, all of us, at one point or another, have judged other people's commitment and engagement in the life of the church by how well they have done one thing or another, or by how much they have given. We might have even felt bad at one time or another for not doing as much as we think we should do. I know I have. I constantly find myself measuring my work as a priest by what others do. When I do, I often feel guilty for not being the best social justice advocate or the most faithful priest to prayer and worship. Or sometimes I question my skill as a priest when I observe another priest pastoral care in the hospital or watch another colleague effortlessly craft a sermon. Each time I succumb to the trap of measuring myself against others, I find myself disappointed and depressed, wondering what the heck I'm even doing as a priest. However, it's in moments like these that I'm reminded by others it's not about how perfect we may be at something, but how much we do the things we do with love. I once heard a very wise person say that God doesn't call the perfect, but perfects the imperfect. Despite that, we seem to succumb to the erroneous idea that our faithfulness to God is measured by how much or how well we do things. It seems this has been a long problem for us as Christians. Some of the earliest writings of Christians, such as the letters of St. Paul, tell us of the inner conflict and turmoil that took place in the early church, all because some members of the Jesus community didn't think the others were living as well as they should. This remains the case today, with some Christians questioning other Christians' faithfulness. For example, I often feel for some of our church leaders today. It seems that no matter what they do, there will always be someone in the church ready to call them out for their faults. Just consider the fierce criticism Archbishop Justin Welby or Pope Francis have faced in recent years. Conservatives will decry each leader as being too liberal and not quick enough to condemn heresies, unorthodox teaching, or immoral behavior. While liberals on the other side will claim that each man is too rigid and slow to accept the ways of the modern world. It's no wonder why their predecessors, Rowan Williams and Benedict, stepped down. They probably always felt as if they weren't always able to do what everyone wanted them to do. It's fitting then that these past few weeks and in the coming weeks, we read St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Although at first glance, it may not seem so apparent, Unfortunately, the compilers of the lectionary, the, the book of readings that we have for each day of the church here, only offer a few selections of the letter, namely the better known parts, and fail to let us get the whole picture of what is going on in that early Christian community. Instead, we are left with, with what sound like the beautiful sayings of St. Paul, such as, we are all one body, 
and love is patient, love is kind. Phrases one commonly finds on decorative plaques hanging from the walls of people's houses, homes, and read at weddings, warming the hearts of all in attendance. The thing is, this is not a letter to comfort and console, but a letter intended to challenge and confront the church in Corinth. As one writer puts it, Paul isn't writing to people who cherish and desire each other. He's writing to people who can't stand the sight of each other. Paul is no priest at the top of an aisle waiting to witness and consecrate young love. He is a frustrated and bewildered spiritual leader calling an errant and self-destructive church to get its act together before it destroys itself. The Corinthian community was on the verge of an implosion by the time Paul writes his letter to them. The community was ravaged by divisions, with one group pitting their favorite leader against another. Everyone in the community was trying and vying for the places of prominence. All the while, the poor and marginalized were ignored or forgotten. From what we can gather, it was the church's version of the modern-day reality competitive TV series, Survivor. It really was. They were all fighting with each other to see who could be the best. Paul is furious with the community and desperate for them to return to the heart of the Jesus movement. How quickly the community had forgotten Jesus' command to love one another as he had loved us, and to care for the sick, the suffering, the poor as Jesus did in his brief ministry. The community forgot the way of love. Before we too quickly sentimentalize love, it's important to understand what Paul means by love here. The love that Paul speaks of in today's reading isn't quite the same love you and I may immediately think of. While we may think of love as a deep affection for another, a compassionate embrace of a friend, companion, or spouse, the love Paul speaks of is a love that seeks not itself, but the good of the other. It is more deep than what the term self-love even refers to. The love Paul speaks of is a love that entirely gives of itself for the good of others. Paul speaks of this love in another one of his letters, namely the letter to the Philippians. Impressed by Jesus' humility and his willingness to deny himself all the privileges of divinity, and embrace the worst form of public shame, death on the cross, Paul writes, Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. It is that form of love that Paul wants his readers in Corinth and us to embrace, a love that seeks not pride of place or acclamation, but a humble love that sacrifices all our wants and desires for the good of others. It is not a selfless love, but a love that gives of the self. It is an Eucharistic love, but which we do as Jesus himself does, and offer our bodies, ourselves, as broken and given for the life of the world. That was precisely the type of love that the Corinthian disciples forgot. In fact, the community so forgot the love of Jesus that their celebration of the Eucharist, what we're doing here today, became scandalous. Rather than a feast for all, the Corinthians made the Eucharist into a gluttonous, drunken feast for the rich, while the poor 
were left forgotten. Contrary to the ways of the Corinthians, we are to love as Christ loved us, to give of ourselves as gift for life for others and all of God's creation. Thus, when we come to the Eucharist, we are to join ourselves with Christ. And I mean this, you and I are actually to say this together. (laughs) Take this serious. When we come here now, we say what Christ himself did 2,000 years ago. Take, eat, this is my body given for you. That's what we're doing here. All of us here are giving of ourselves as gift, our bodies for the life of the world. Paul's concern is not about how gifted and talented we may be, but that we use our gifts in ways that put others first. It is not about how good we may be at one thing or another, but how well we love others, particularly the stranger, the ignored, the broken and the marginalized. But what does this mean for us here at St. Anne's? It means we are to put others first and not ourselves. To ask what others feel and think, to lavishly welcome them into the ways of God's love. And to go from this place and out into the world and to the places of pain, hunger, loneliness, and to love as Christ has loved us. We are not to be concerned with how long we may, may have been here and how important we may be in this community, nor are we curators of a museum, an art piece to be marveled at. Rather, we gather here to learn the way of love from the one who loved us most, and to do as he had done so long ago and continues to do so this day, to give of ourselves as gift for others. There's a wonderful prayer in the Book of Common Prayer, which I know we don't always use here, but it's said right after we receive communion, I think the words speak so wonderfully about the love that I'm speaking of here. In fact, it's unfortunate we don't say this anymore. They, they refer to another letter of Paul, but I think the Book of Common Prayer says it best. The people pray together. Here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. In other words, We are to be bred, broken, and given for all. Amen.